Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And this week we are joined by what you might be able to call my, or who you might be able to call my nemesis here, uh, Matt Dawkins, all the way from Florida. And, uh, but strangely represented the West coast cycling team, because I guess Florida has both coasts, uh, Matt, it's exciting to have you on here. How you doing? Good. Thank you, Jonathan. Glad to get to talk to you today. Yeah. This is, uh, the reason that I called you my nemesis in this regard is because you won the national championship that I, that I was shooting for as well. Uh, I didn't think that, uh, I would get to interview. I didn't even know you used trainer road. <laughs> didn't even know you listened to the podcast or anything. Uh, we only had time to briefly chat between uh, cross-eyed stairs there at the end of the race. Uh, but Super exciting. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty neat. I'm, uh, definitely happy and train, train road and you guys, the podcast, and everything helped out. So, uh, hopefully you can give away too many, uh, of your secrets to help me out there. <laughs> hey, if I'm not going to win it, I'd much rather have a trainer road athlete win it as well, you know? So yeah, for if sure. it's going to go down that way, uh, it's pretty exciting. So, uh, let's just talk about this. So uh, like I, I have it wrote down. I was like, Matt won my national championship that I wanted to win. And I want to talk about, you know, we'll go through how you prepared and how you executed to win a national championship, especially because, uh, that's the most competitive cat one age group there is, uh, right now. And so basically the other than pro it's the most competitive cat one age group you could win. It's a prestigious field, but Matt, I, I had never, I'd heard of the majority of like the top 10 or so riders, but I'd never heard of you. Do you have like a, a long history in cycling or in sport? What is your athletic background? Um, yes, I used to be a runner, you know, back in high school, nothing spectacular, you know, just kind of regular high school cross country athlete, um, was inspired to get into cycling in college, um, which would have been about 10 years ago now, um, by some family members. And I'm like, this is a lot better than running it. You go fast, you have fun, <laughs> but it was strictly on the road side of things. Um, I, I had no interest ever in touching a mountain bike. It sounded really just not fun. <laughs> um, and a few years back, probably five, six years, um, some coworkers got me into mountain biking, um, which we do have in Florida. It's, it's different, but you're still off road. Um, and I was like, this is cool. And just sort of kept doing that, focused on that the last, you know, four or five years, um, intently mostly racing here in the Southeast, um, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, you know, closer to home. Um, so definitely, you know, you guys, I know all race each other out West and in Colorado. So I was the opposite. I knew nobody going into the race. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, but definitely a little bit different perspective. Yeah. Did that. So th this had to have come. And if you're listening to this, talk about polar opposites, the mountain bike national championships we're talking about. We're at winter park, Colorado, uh, 10,000 feet of elevation is what we're racing at very high. And in Florida, extremely flat, uh, even lower than sea level in some spots, <laughs> but it's just as low as it gets the, the total opposite, different competition that had to have been, were you intimidated by that going from something that seemed like you would be so much a, a fish out of water and even in unfamiliar circumstances with unfamiliar competition? I think you can look at it both ways. Um, you know, I was almost too naive to know any better. Like I wasn't intimidated because I didn't know any of these guys' names, you know, other than you, I knew, I knew you were fast and I had to watch <laughs> out for you. Um, I'd never been at altitude riding my bike before. I had no idea what was going to happen. So I was like, let's just ride and, and whatever happens, I, I prepared as best as I can. Um, and we'll, you know, take it as it comes during the race. So I think it could have been an advantage as well. Yeah. Did you, did you let's, um, and, and this is going to be all out of order here, but uh, on the elevation side of things, what were your thoughts? Were you thinking that you would adjust your pacing because of elevation? I know you listen to the podcast. I'm sure you've heard us talk about that. Or did you just kind of decide that you go by feel? How did, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I just ride by feel anyway. I, I don't look at the computer ever during the race. Um, even on climbs like that. Um, I knew you don't want to go too hard at elevation just, just from the week I was up there, I could feel like it hurts a lot. <laughs> um, but I also knew, you know, that I'm probably capable of more than I think I am. So I was just trying to find that fine line of not blowing up, but also trying to stay in contention. Um, and that, that was about it. Just kept going and my legs held out just long enough, I think. 
Yeah. So let's talk about that first climb. It's like a 10 minute climb, roughly, I guess a little shorter on the first lap, but we went extremely hard, (laughs) uh, really, really hard out of the gate. I wasn't looking at power either intentionally. Otherwise I probably would have eased off long before I did. Uh, was that your tactic to go that hard? I I don't even know if you were leading at that point, looking back, it's all a blur. It, it, it wasn't me. Um, I, I led about halfway up the climb and then some other folks picked up the pace and, and I said, Nope, don't want to do that right now. So I kind of tucked in and, and like fourth or fifth wheel when we, um, got to the top into the single track. Um, yeah, I just felt like, if I went any harder at that point, I, w- I would, you know, blow up, but I was able to keep on the wheels that I need to keep on at that point and, and stay with the group. So coming from Florida, are you, uh, cause the trails that they do have in Florida, from what I've heard, they've got a, a quite a large amount of technical features actually. So with routes, bridges, uh, and, and all sorts of, of difficult stuff, you also deal with, with rain and slick conditions, uh, not irregularly as well. So do you feel like you are, uh, technically proficient rider to like hold at that level we're talking it's so different right because you're dealing with these big mountain descents it it had to have been so strange what what was your perspective on the descending side yeah it was it was just amazingly different in florida like you said it's tight twisty Um, a lot of our trails are in old mining pits basically so they're 20 30 feet deep or you've got like what they dug out is piled up on the side now and it's 20 feet tall and you go up and down so it's a few seconds of power up and then you go down and a few seconds of power up the other side. Um, so, <laughs> wow. you know, nothing like a 10 minute climb or a, I don't know what it was, four or five minute, you know, descent where you don't have to pedal. Um, so totally different, but I think, you know, those turning skills, um, you know, getting used to roots, some of the technical stuff, it, it does cross over, you know, you're still riding a bike, even yeah. though it's, it's somewhat different. So let's, uh, I guess, was there a critical moment in the race? for you where you felt like you made the right decisions to put yourself in the position to win? Um, I, like I said, I think I went into the, the single track on that first lap in fifth place and I just stayed on the wheel, the person in front of me. Um, when I had a chance, I, I would pass. Um, like you said, every lap was a 10 minute climb. So just made sure nobody got away from me there. Um, and then going up the final climb, I attacked, um, just before the single track and got sort of the, you know, the whole shot into the woods and was able to keep the power on. Um, so I think that was the most critical point right there where I got that, that final whole shot, so to speak. And when you did attack there, did you feel like you were, had something in reserve and you were ready to attack or was it one of those attacks where you feel like you're on the ropes, but you know, it was last lap. So you just gave it. Yeah. I say the, the latter, um, I knew it was the last chance and whoever could get in that climb first probably would, be first down to the bottom and across the line. Um, and, and I was trying to think and, and strategize as I was climbing, but you know how your brain goes at that point. Um, and then suddenly it was like, Oh shoot, this is the top of the climb. I better do something now. And, and I look back and no one was there. I was like, well, look at that. Keep going. <laughs> so this all seems, I'm sure somebody listening to this is just like, it seems like he just made it happen, just did it. So let's talk about what, made you the athlete you were on race day. Let's talk about all the preparation that you had. Um, did, what was your first like FTP test that you can remember in terms of where your fitness was? I'm not sure. I've, I've kind of had power meter on and off on different bikes, um, over the last few years, but I've never really used it for anything other than just novelty. Yeah. You know, um, looking at it after rides and, and, kind of that type of stuff, but never, never for any sort of purpose. Um, so I don't think I'd ever actually done, um, any sort of testing or any formalized things like that. Um, I started uh, using trainer road and, and getting more focused, um, January of this year, um, basically. Um, so it probably, you know, fairly similar to where I ended up in, in June, um, you know, in terms of the, the FTP, but I think just the, the repeatability and some of those things were a lot better. Yeah. So what is, uh, what, what did you put your threshold at in trainer road? And then we'll talk about the, the training you did. Um, I believe about 360. 360. And how much do you weigh? Uh, 165. 
So that's a high threshold uh, that you're carrying, and you're probably what somewhere around. I'm going to do some quick math on that one, um, but you've got I a high threshold. Yeah, it's somewhere close to five, I believe, is what it four yeah. point something on there. Yeah. So I mean, if you are in a position where you're four point nine roughly, but with that high of a threshold, that's got to be really helpful when you're dealing with anything that sucks out power from somebody like rough or uneven surfaces, crosswinds, speed, anything like that. You've got to be in a great position for it. And 4.9 watts per kilogram gets you in like the ticket to be able to compete right at national championships. So, um, did you, let's talk about the training that you did. What, what sort of training did you follow leading into national championships and what was the motivation behind that? Um, yeah, like I said, I kind of got on a trainer road, in January, my, uh, my wife actually had shoulder surgery back in December and, and could only ride indoors for, you know, three months. Um, and she, she started using it and she's like, this is kind of cool. Um, so I started doing it, a mix of inside and, and outside workouts actually. Um, cause winter is our nice season down here yeah. in Florida. <laughs> That's when we want to get outside. Um, and I think I just did the sweet spot base plan and then, um, a sustained power type of plan. Cause I knew, um, those climbs, you know, we're going to, what would determine it at nationals being a 10 minute climb each lap, um, a lot different than kind of the punchy courses I'm used to in Florida. Mm. Um, so I was trying to focus on the course specific training really. Um, and then would stick to the plan as best I could during the week. Um, on the weekends definitely would go do group rides or, you know, mm -hmm. ride with my wife and, and kind of have that, um, mental aspect where you need to need to have a little bit of fun along the way as well. Yeah. So with, uh, let's talk about the training itself. Like you said, very different than what you're used to when you were out doing mountain bike races or mountain bike rides with the short punches was the sustained work really hard for you at first, since it was a departure from that. I think the way it built wasn't terrible doing, um, some of the sweet spot work first, was nice to get that base before going into those longer threshold type intervals. Um, so yeah, of course it, it's painful to do those workouts, yeah. but it didn't feel overwhelming, um, at any point, I think just because of the way it, it built up nicely. Did you find that you were at a disadvantage riding all the short punchy climbs then when you were riding mountain bikes, because you had been working on sustained power, that give and take, did it put you at a disadvantage? I think it probably did. Um, my definitely like the, the shorter sprints, but I think having that sort of higher base level, um, allowed the repeatability to be a little bit better. So, you know, maybe somebody can get away from me, but the next one, the next one I'll catch back up and, and be able to, to get back to where I was. Yeah. Was sweet spot training hard at first? Uh, I, you know, then again, I guess you have great opportunities for steady uh, state work out on the road too there, but was that difficult at first, the getting used to that? It was some of the, um, just the length of some of the intervals when you first kind of look at the, the workout <laughs> for the day, you're like, I got to do this long. It, it, it's, it seems overwhelming. And then you look back, you know, two months later and you're like, oh man, that was a short one. Like, yeah. Um, so it's, it's yeah, amazing how it's kind of all, all relative, but, uh, definitely at first having not done a lot of structure, it, it did seem daunting. Yeah. What did you do to cope with that? Did you have any sort of strategies that you had to be able to get yourself over that hump? Um, I would just go out and, and just tell myself, okay, like yesterday I did this one, it hurt, but it wasn't terrible. I can still walk. I can still move. You know, I made it back to the car. <laughs> so now we're just doing another minute or another five Watts or, you know, the rest is a little bit shorter and just said, Hey, it's, it's bite-sized pieces. Um, and just went for it. And sometimes it didn't work, you know, some workouts you, you don't nail them, but, um, overall, I think it, it kind of reinforced itself that like, okay, this is working. I'm getting better. Yeah. How do you fuel this? Cause at a 360 FTP, you burn a lot of calories with that high of a threshold. Uh, how do you feel your work, your workouts normally, and then on the bike? And then also, then we'll get into off the bike nutrition. Yeah. You know, that's my wife. I just, I eat a lot. I'm kind of <laughs> always eating. Um, you know, I lucky enough right now to be able to work from home, um, which 
makes it easy to kind of get in and out of the pantry and the refrigerator. Sometimes that's dangerous. <laughs> sometimes that's good. Um, nothing, nothing in particular, some oatmeal, um, you know, lots of salads, vegetables, and then some sort of carb with, you know, whether it's potatoes or rice or uh, pasta. So not, nothing too fancy, but uh, my wife does a great job of keeping me fed. That's for sure. What about on the bike? What do you typically take in during those workouts when you're that sustained work? You just rack up so many cal- uh, calories so quickly. Yeah. I find it's kind of a balance because I want to eat the gels to kind of get used to that for a race. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I, like, I want to be eating these sugary gels and goos every single day or, you know, three, four times a week. Um, so I'll, I'll try to eat maybe like, uh, like fig bars on some of the longer ones, something else that's a little bit more real food, but still, you know, gives you those carbs and the sugar that you need. Um, so I'm not just eating basically, you know, liquid candy every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, what about your schedule? Let's talk about that. You mentioned working from home. What do you do for work? And then what's your family situation like? Um, I'm a civil engineer, so I, I do roadway design basically. Um, you know, I lucky enough for now to be able to work from home and my company's pretty, pretty flexible. Um, it's just me and my wife here, no kids, uh, which I think also helps. Uh, you know, I know you, you've got a young one there that uh, takes up a lot of time at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, not having a commute right now is, is much nicer, um, being able to either walk 20 feet and hop on the trainer or, you know, get outside quickly, easily. Um, but it's, it, you know, I do work to work weekends. Sometimes there's definitely some late nights, um, that do get in the way of, you know, training. You got to remind myself, this is not, not a job. It's not what pays the bills. Um, you know, sometimes I got to skip a workout and, and, you know, get the work done. Yeah. Cause with civil engineering, I'm sure that you work with some pretty, uh, big deadlines too, uh, with projects that you're working on and simply push comes to shove. Right. And it needs to, it needs to exactly. Move. Yeah. Are we there... work with, you know, the public and elected officials and, and, and we have, you know, meetings and those dates don't move. So, yep, you're totally right. So when that happens, is there a certain like if you have to skip a workout in the week, did you prioritize a specific type of workout and then let a different type of workout slide when you needed to skip? Or did you just um, skip whichever one that was next and call it good? It would normally kind of depend on how I was feeling. Um, I would try to skip the like the endurance rides if possible. Um, if I thought I could like rearrange things and do back to back or maybe kind of switch the rest day. Cause I really wanted to hit the, you know, the intervals, the more intense sessions and not miss those as, as best as possible. Sometimes it, it wasn't worth it. Like if I knew I was tired, there's no point in probably going out there and just failing it. So I would say, okay, let's, let's try something else today. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, getting in some work rather than no work. Right. And Also those big days, if you, I've kind of noticed that too, with a lot of different athletes, if you can't take on the big day, then you take on one that, you know, you can hit right. And then save that for another time. Um, so with that, when do you fit in your training? You mentioned that you work from home, but do you typically train at a specific time of day? And you mentioned outside workouts as well. So do you, can you do those from home or do you have to drive? Yeah. Um, I typically do them in the afternoon or the evening, you know, after work. Um, like to kind of get them done and then make my dinner afterwards, basically. So I'm kind of having dinner and refueling. Um, I'm able to do some of the outdoor workouts near here. Um, you know, anything that's like three to five minutes, we've got just nice flat roads. Um, so, well, it's not as great as, you know, a long steady climb. You don't have that downhill that kind of can screw you up as well if you've got rolling terrain. So, I mean, you can if you got five minutes and you need to hold the power number, you can hold that number because there's nothing in your way, no hills, <laughs> no downhill. Um, that is one of the the beautiful things about flat Florida, at least. Yeah. It's a, it's kind of like a built-in trainer <laughs> in that regard, right? Yep. So do you, how do you decide which workouts you do inside and which ones you do outside? Is it based on interval length? Yeah. Some of it's just the practicality. Um, you know, 20 minutes without a stoplight or without a stop sign, trying to keep a certain power is, is really hard to do. Um, 
we've got one one sort of local trail that just the big seven mile circle no road crossings no nothing so you can go out there and do it but that also gets mentally taxing just doing the same circles over and over and over again um so it it's some of it is based on just what feels better that day and some of it is actually you know what's practical and and physically doable yeah so that thinking about your background being a runner uh 10 minute climb at national championships i mean that would be like if somebody's running two miles on the tracks and that's in high school uh, the long event right that's really long is that what you did when you were growing up in track and field longer events or were you better at shorter events i started off with the shorter events and then the coaches kept putting me longer and longer and longer and I did better and better and better. So <laughs> by the time I ended, yeah, I was doing the two mile and then the cross country, which was, I guess it's 5k, that type of stuff as well. Yeah. Did you, um, so do you think that you're better at longer sustained work? Yeah, I, I would say that's fair to say. That's interesting, right? Living in Florida and having the environment in which you've been a mountain biker has been short punches, uh, yet you, have this physiology for these longer sustained efforts. Um, do you find that it takes you a long time to build repeatability as a result of that? I think for the, the more intense, yes, like the, the shorter and more intense it is, um, for sure. I think there's a, at some point it comes easier. I don't know exactly where that, where that breakover is, but yeah, I mean, I'm not, probably winning any, you know, field sprints or anything like that. Right. Is that, so let's kind of rewind back to national championships. We talked about the elevation, everything else. What were your other big question marks coming into such a big event? Um, I had never done, you know, nationals like this. I had done mountain bike nationals one time, which is definitely a smaller scale than the cross country nationals or sorry, I had done marathon nationals, never the, uh, cross country, cross country just got a lot going on, a lot of races, a lot of categories downhill. Um, so just the logistics of the whole thing, yeah. how to make that happen. Um, you know, going to, to Colorado, when to get there, where to sleep. Um, there was a lot, a lot to worry about. Um, other than that, you know, I figured it was still just a bike race. Um, so treat it like normal. What were your goals coming into it? did you have a specific place you wanted to go for or was it purely just intrinsic, more performance based on your end? Yeah. Like I said, I didn't really know who I was racing, how I would stack up, how my body would handle elevation. Um, yeah, I honestly thought I could finish anywhere from last to first. I, I <laughs> understood. I think any of those were possible. Um, so that's kind of how I set it up. I just want to go out and, you know, ride the thing cleanly and not have any, you know, dumb mistakes or anything I can look back on and be like, that's, that's what cost me this or that. Um, so yeah, I was pretty open-minded just wanting to go out and, and ride. So what did you do? Well, do you feel like leading up to the event and then executing at the event? What did you particularly well that set you apart? I think I did a good job once I got to Colorado of resting. Um, I'd never been out there to ride my bike before and I just wanted to ride and, and, you know, winter park has just so many cool trails, the bike park, the national forest, you know, Colorado in general. Um, and it was hard to say, no, I'm here to ride my bike, race my bike. Let's leave the vacation stuff until afterwards, so to speak. Um, I think that was, was just kind of the hardest thing was not doing too much beforehand. Yeah. Um, what about leading up even before then, do you feel like there was a key thing you did in training that set you up to win a national championship? I think just being consistent, just going out there and, and, and doing it, um, was the biggest thing really. Yeah. What about the mistakes? Do, what do you feel like you could have done better? I'm not sure. I, I haven't went back and, and thought about that. Honestly. Um, I know there's it's great. Don't think about it at all. I could have done better. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully next time you haven't thought about it either. Yeah. <laughs> um, th this, this year was interesting because we had the whole COVID pandemic that actually canceled last year's nationals. Yeah. Um, so that kind of threw a wrench in the, the plans, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, so maybe kind of just handling that a little better in terms of what I did with that 
break in, in racing and things along those lines. Yeah. Is there something on the race execution side when you were in the race that you feel like you could have done better? Um, no, I think I raced it smart. Um, you know, of course you always want to be like in the front and not following people downhill and, and doing things like that. But I think given the limitations and the, the question marks I had, um, about how the altitude would affect me, I think I raced it pretty smart. Yeah. Did you, uh, what about equipment choices? I think that you were on a Scott uh, spark. Was that correct? The full correct. suspension XC bike. Yep. Did you, what sort of tires did you run? Uh, all that stuff, break it down. Um, I just pretty much left everything I normally run on there. Um, nothing different than, than what I would run in Florida. I think they were, um, Victoria tires, I think on the front of Victoria Barzo and then a, a Maxis, um, recon race on the back. Um, I do like the little wider tires, 2.35 or 2.4. Yeah. Um, and I had a dropper post just because it's on my bike. Um, mm -hmm. for other races and, and it's not necessary in Florida, but it's one of those things it's, it makes it fun. Yeah. So I didn't go out of my way to remove that or anything. Um, just kind of left the bike as well as basically. Yeah. Impressive, man. I, I, this is, uh, it, it's cool to be able to interview for you for this. Part of me just wants to be like, you did fantastic. Never question a thing you did. In fact, just relax before we race again. That'd be great, <laughs> but it's fun to be able to, to talk to you and to kind of see the other side of it. Um, from the outside in, uh, it seems like you had done a huge amount of work with consistency to get to the point where you could execute at that high power to weight ratio that you had on race day. Um, and you did well with resting, just like you said, everything else. Um, what's, what's next for you? I mean, the rumors are of course that the next national championships will be back East, uh, since that's usually the schedule that they run on. So that might be close by for you, but you've mentioned that you're good at the long stuff. So is marathon national championships a more enticing goal for you? Yeah, we'd like to give that a try. Um, I think it's in Maryland this year, so somewhat closer, you know, within been driving range more or less of Florida. Um, so that would be a, a nice one to go after. Yeah. I did that one in the past and I finished second in the, uh, in the age group. So I'd like to win that one as well, if possible. Nice double up for the year. That would be great. So, yeah. And how'd you do in short track? Short track. I ended up second. Second. Wow. Um, what a year. Fantastic. Yeah. I, uh, man, I was almost, almost onto your back wheel, uh, the, the last lap going up <laughs> yeah. that, that climb and you took off like a little mountain goat. I was impressed. <laughs> yeah. So, well, this is, um, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to interview and so cool. It makes me personally so happy to know that a trainer road user is the one that beat me. Um, that's awesome. I love to hear that. Uh, I'm excited to see how everything goes for you at marathon national champs too, uh, Matt, it's going to be exciting. If people want to get in touch with you, how's the best way? I don't know if you're on the trainer road forum or Instagram, what's best. I'm not on any of that stuff. Unfortunately, nice. <laughs> uh, I don't have a, have a good way to be reached. I don't, I don't really have social media beyond just a Facebook account. Um, so I, I can't give you a good answer, unfortunately. <laughs> Well then reach out to us and we can get you in touch with Matt directly. How about that? If you have any questions on his setup or performance or anything else, uh, are you looking forward to racing cross country national championships next year? Are you planning? I hope on so. If, uh, cool. if the, yeah, the cards align and everything, I'd love to go for it. Cool. I'm hoping that it's, uh, I'm hoping so as well for myself. So we get to, we get to race again. Hopefully I'll be even better prepared. Uh, yeah, definitely wasn't fun. ready for your speed. That's for sure. So <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Matt. I appreciate this. Um, if anybody wants to share their experiences of how trainer road has made you a faster cyclist, you can do so just reach out. You can go to trainerroadcom slash S a P. And if you go there, then you'll be able to enter into a form just like Matt did. And he'll be able to share, uh, you'll be able to share how trainer road helped you make or achieve whatever goal it doesn't have to be a national championship. It could just be anything that you consider to be an achievement. Uh, all of us can be inspired and learn from each and every one of us that are listening now. So please share that, uh, do that. And we will talk to you all next time. Thanks a bunch. And thanks, Matt. Thank you.